Schweiz vor, ja. All right, well, what are we doing here in New Hampshire after a hurricane getting soaked? Well, we're here to talk about fall. So I thought I've been shooting autumn and fall for the last, I don't know, five or six years in New Hampshire and Maine and Vermont. And I've got kind of a list of best practices, if you will, that I've employed over the past couple years to make sure that I hit fall um, at peak get peak foliage, have a good experience, get good photo. So I thought I'd share those with you and uh, yeah, let's get right to it. All right, so the first thing is to plan. And I know that sounds pretty obvious, right? Plan a trip. But I think there's a particular element of planning that has to go into a photography trip. And what that means is basically create a shot list. And then what I do is I plot the locations on um, Google Maps. And the reason why I do this is because it allows you to see that certain locations are really close to each other and certain locations are not close to each other. And when you're looking at distances like what's covered in the White Mountains, for example, you know, it takes about an hour, maybe an hour and a half to drive the Cam Camagus Highway across the entire Whites and even further if you're going north up to Mount Washington. So you don't want to be crisscrossing back and forth and plus, the traffic can get pretty bad during the fall foliage season because everyone wants to be there. And so when you take that all into account, you can save a lot of time if you have a shot list of places that you wanna go, shots you wanna take, maybe some places are gonna look good in the morning, some are gonna look good in the evening. So you wanna think about all of that and create essentially an itinerary for yourself where you wanna be at each point in the day and which shots you wanna take. I mean, look at this vista. It's incredible, right? Lonesome Lake in the clouds, gorgeous. <clears throat> so the next thing I wanted to talk about was what is peak? I mean, we obsess over this idea of peak foliage. When's peak gonna be? And we DM each other and we're very thrilled about hitting peak and we all wanna claim we hit it because we're geniuses, but nobody knows when peak is. I mean, conceptually, to me at least, there's a concept there, right? It's, it's essentially the period where the largest proportion, the maximum proportion of trees are yellow, orange, or red, right? The foliage we're looking for. They're not green, they're not brown, there are leaves on the trees, right? They haven't fallen down. So it's that point where it's like maximum color. And it's the point where the largest proportion of of leaves are those colors. Because of course, some leaves are still green and some leaves are, are gone, they're on the ground or brown, but it's that, that particular period where you've maximized it. We know peak is gonna be sometime, at least in New England, in the White Mountains, it's gonna be sometime between late September and mid-October. It might be early, it might be late. So it's those three weeks, maybe the last week of September, the first week of October, second week of October. Those are the weeks when you really want to target for foliage. Personally, I think it's way better to be early than late. So I'd much rather show up and see a lot of color, but then see a little bit of green than I would to see a fair amount of color and a lot of brown or leaves off of the trees, a lot of bare leaf trees. That to me is, makes me sad. It makes me want to have been there earlier. Okay, so we've established that it's a little bit hard to tell when peak is gonna be and when you wanna be up in the whites. So I find it a little bit weird that so many people plan a three or four day weekend around Columbus Day slash Indigenous Peoples Day. It's a good time. I mean, it's early October, it makes a lot of sense, but you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And to me, that doesn't make that much sense. My advice, or at least my experience, what's worked for me, is instead of doing that four day weekend around the holiday, I try to go up a couple times, you know, once a week for two or three weeks. And the benefit there is you're, you're kind of spreading out your weeks, right? So if peak is early that year, then you're up there that week. If it's late that year, then you're up there that week. So it's nice to spend one day a week 
you know, for a two or three week period around when you guess that peak is gonna happen. And that gives you a lot greater chance of being up there at the same time that, you, that peak is happening. And it also helps hedge your bets a little bit. If you're gonna have a bad weather day or, you know, you're just not feeling it someday, well, that's okay because you're heading up the next week and you have another shot that week. So that's my advice. Spread out your weeks instead of bucketing them all around one weekend. And I think that you'll have a greater success, at least I have in the past couple of years. One thing I wanna mention that I didn't is accommodations. Now, it's pretty expensive to stay in an Airbnb in the White Mountains this time of year. I'd say maybe around 200 to $400 last time I checked. So camping is a great alternative. The problem is that camping, even in the, um, in the White Mountains, camping is pretty uh, hard to come by. It's cheaper, but it's, um, it fills up very quickly. So a great alternative is dispersed camping. And in Tripoli Road, uh, this is an area that's open for the summer until I think around like the end of October, right by the Can Camagus Highway. Uh, there's a dispersed campground area within the White Mountains National Forest. And this is great because it's right where the action is. It's um, relatively cheap. I think it's like $20 for um, a period of nights actually during the week. And then it gets a little bit more expensive on the weekends. And it's dispersed camping, which means you have to bring your own water in, your own food, of course. And, um, and uh, you have to be okay, okay not having showers for that night and for... Um, using porta pots, but uh, honestly, like it's camping in a, it's pretty similar to a campground. I've camped in a lot of dispersed camping areas, and this is frankly like a campground. I mean, there's a road, there are graded, you know, flat uh, campsites all along that road with fire rings. There are lots of people. It's not scary. It's you know very popular and and totally fine, um, and it's a great alternative. The benefit is you don't need to book. A place in advance and I don't even know if you can so you just sort of show up drive down the road find a spot and set up your tent or sleep in your car whatever you're gonna do it's very flexible very easy it's a great way to just you know have a backup if you're heading up for a day trip and you end up wanting to stay or something like that frankly you can drive down the Can Camagus Highway in like 10 minutes you can go to McDonald's or one of the great restaurants around there so or a grocery store or something like that so it's very accessible and really easy but a great alternative and a, and a little known i think option that um, a lot of people don't know about so i wanted to share that with you as an alternative accommodation if you can't find an airbnb or a campsite in an official campground so i wanted to talk a little bit about composition now one option is to frame your subject. So if you find a nice road or something like that, and you can fit the fall foliage kind of arcing over top of your you know, subject, the road, and you got a little bit of foliage on the ground, a little bit on the sides, it can look really, really, really good. And the forest roads are a great option for framing your car or other sorts of subjects in that type of setting. Another thing I like is looking up at the sun coming through the fall foliage. This can be really cool if you're shooting an early morning or evening light where you have kind of a diagonal stream of light. Maybe there's a little bit of dust from the road you're driving down. Who knows, but there's something to kind of catch that light as it's coming through the trees and highlighting that combination of beautiful warm light with the warm colors of the foliage and highlighting that time of year. So that's another great composition option. Now, another thing that I think is, um, you know, classic and always works is if you have a water feature like a water glacial bowl or um, the lake, you know, by Cannon uh, Ski Mountain right by Artist Bluff. We've all seen that photo, this shot right here. It looks amazing, right, because you have the leading lines of the road with the lake in the foreground and the fall foliage on the sides and, and the moody clouds. That type of framing is just really really effective and very easy to find in the white mountains particularly if you take some of the hikes that get you above some of the ridge hikes so i think kinsman ridge or franconia ridge uh, gulf side um, artist bluff is probably the most accessible of those options but hikes that get you above the uh, terrain and show you that vista it's hard to capture that unless you're willing to put in a little bit of sweat to get above the 
um, of the, above the landscape and, and to take that perspective. Okay, so the final thing I wanted to talk about was post-processing. And if you shoot raw like I do, and I think most people do these days, post-processing is something you need to do anyway, right? Because the photo's coming out of the camera and it needs to be processed. It's not a JPEG. It hasn't been processed in camera. But this is a particular issue and a particular challenge when it comes to fall photography. And why is that? Well, I would posit and offer to you that the subject of a fall photo, more often than not, is actually the color. The color is kind of the thing that your subject is. The trees provide a medium for that color, but the, the actual subject of the photo, the thing that someone's gonna take away from it, the thing you're featuring, is the color itself. And because Lightroom is so powerful, and the hue, saturation, luminance panel in Lightroom and, and Photoshop is even more powerful, is so um, uh, capable at, at altering color that there is a tendency and a risk that you can overdo it with editing fall photos. Now on the flip side, I think increasing vibrance and adjusting luminance and saturation is actually also necessary and essential in editing a fall photo, but it's very easy to overdo it. So there's kind of this like very fine line when one alters the hue of a photo and one takes this green kind of landscape behind me and tweaks that hue lever or uh, gradient to make that green yellow and maybe make the yellows orange, basically to make this scene into a peak fall scene. What, what I'm doing if I do that or what one is doing is they're altering the subject. And I see that as akin to you know, taking a photo of somebody who's uh, skateboarding and you know, changing something about that person skateboarding, right? The subject is the skateboarder. And if you're altering that subject, you're, you're starting to get into a dicey territory. It's fine to dodge and to change you know, the background here and there to address uh, imperfections in the photo, but it's something different to change the subject. And so I offer that to you. Be mindful of that. You know, edit uh, carefully when you're dealing with luminosity, uh, saturation, and hue for these photos. You know, take care in that process, but also be very mindful of it because I think the photo, uh, raw photos tend to, you know, undersaturate and under uh, 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 value those colors. And that is, of course, the subject you're trying to highlight. So it's, it's a very fine line but I think it's a line that, that we all have to kind of find on our own for our own styles, but it's at least, I think, worthwhile being thoughtful about that process. Well, that's what I got for you today. The mosquitoes are starting to come out, and so I've got to get out of here and make sure I don't get eaten alive. But, you know, those are some tips and some best practices that I've developed over the years for taking fall photos in the White Mountains, and I hope they're valuable to you. Like I said at the start, please let me know what you think, and if you have, um, your own perspectives or, th or thoughts that you'd add or things you'd maybe disagree with. Um, I, I hope to engage with all of you on this, but more importantly than not, I, I hope you get outside. I hope you bring your camera, go hiking, take photos in New England and elsewhere where the leaves are changing and enjoy this incredible time of year where we can appreciate the changing of the seasons and uh, this transition from summer to eventually winter. Take care and be well. Bye-bye.